Okay, uh, you'll notice I've actually added to the title of this, because, by way of explanation, Leviticus, the way of holiness, which is what Leviticus is about, and that's what we're going to be talking about primarily today. Um, our schedule today, Leviticus, the way of holiness, next week, Numbers, and I've added to that too, in the desert, because it's the, the description of the 40 years of wandering around in the desert, and all that happened. My people are the people of the desert. Oh, oh I did it, didn't I? <laughs> In the, des in the dessert. <laughs> well, okay, yeah, Car Carolyn's referring to the fact I lived in Pasadena for many years. And in Pasadena, there was a conceptual artist. Conceptual artists are, are uh, artists that do things that make you have to think about. <laughs> it's the best explanation. And on the side of a building, do you know uh, T.E. Lawrence? It was Lawrence of Arabia. Okay? And he was famous for saying, my people are the people of the desert meaning he was a British officer who had gone to the desert and, and developed a relationship so that the, the uh, Arabic people, the desert people, joined with the British in the war against the Ottomans. Anyway, um, on the side of this building was this giant uh, passage written, and it said, my people are the people of the desert, said T.E. Lawrence, picking up his fork. <laughs> Well, I'm sh people would read that and read that and read that and not get it, not realizing the only difference was they'd added an extra S, the dessert, picking up his fork. Never mind. Okay, let's go back to Aren't you glad that I brought that up? Thank I you, Carolyn, I for that little sign. I thought you to know that typo in there. Think about it. I'll come to you later. Um, That's great. So, next week, numbers in the deserts, not dessert. <laughs> And then uh, week eight, Deuteronomy and the final exam. Those of you in the other classes have heard me say that I leave tomorrow morning. I'm going to be gone for a few days. And I'm going to have some long flights, and I'm going to have some time in between meetings. And I will work on the uh, study notes for this so that hopefully by the end of the weekend, I will uh, email them back to Carolyn. She can put them up online, and you can pull them down. This is the uh, what you need to know from the class. Again, I recommend you pull those down and study them, even if you're not planning on taking the test. I think you should take the test because it's a useful experience. But um, if you don't have access or either can't get online or can't print it for some reason, I'll have a few copies of it next week when we gather, so you'll have time to look over that. Um, any questions about that? Okay. The Book of Leviticus. Give you a couple of I, I use this as kind of a standard format for introducing the uh, books when I've done survey classes and things. We believe I, I I accept the traditional view that the author of Leviticus was Moses, and that he wrote it sometime 1445 to 1400 BC. So we're talking um, a little over 3,000 years ago, um, and that that timing is important. I'm going to get to something a little bit later uh, having to do with some of what you read in Leviticus that you may not have recognized how extraordinary it is with regard to all of the cautions about if you have diseases, yeah. how you're not supposed to act. They did not discover the, the theory of contagion in disease until the 1500s AD. And this was written almost 1500 BC. They had a clear indication that diseases were communicated from one person to the other. For instance, a person who has the description is a man who has gonorrhea, basically, is not allowed to spit because the understanding was that he, he carried something in his body that could be communicated, you know. Um, think about how extraordinary that is. 3,000 years before they discovered communicable diseases, the book of Leviticus gives instructions as to what you're not supposed to do if you have the symptoms of a disease that could be communicable. All right? Yes. And did you catch that when you were reading it? Yes. Uh, pretty amazing. Okay, anyway. Um, the theme is the explanation of law and sacrifice. Even more so, I think I would say that the theme is, and I've got this under purpose, to instruct Israel on how to become holy and then how to remain holy. The book of Leviticus really is broken into two large sections. The first um, 17 chapters deal with how you become holy. Particularly, that's the sacrificial system and the, the Day of Atonement is the culmination of that. How people can can achieve holiness or righteousness initially. And then the second half of the book is how you then live in such a way that you can maintain holiness. It does say that when you mess up, and you will, you know, you will sin, but to be as righteous as you can, to live as holy as you can, there are means for coming back and reestablishing it. But the, the point is, how do you become holy, and then how do you remain holy? What do you do to get right with God, and then how do you live in order to try to stay right with God? 
Get that? Um, the outline, there are basically five sections to this. Uh, sacrifice, the first seven chapters, and that too is broken up. I'm going to take these one at a time in a few minutes and talk about them. Then the institution of the priesthood in chapters 8 through 10. The uh, clean and unclean. What things can make you clean and unclean, pure and impure. And then um, the Day of Atonement as the ultimate act of sacrifice that will clear away sin once a year. And then laws for daily life. That's the how do you then stay holy? How do you remain pure? How does God want you to live? Those are the base, that's the basic outline. Um, another way of looking at that, I've used this before on some of them too. Again, the first part is about sacrifice. How do you get holy? The second part is sanctification. How do you live in such a way that you can continue to be holy? Um, it is the way of God, to how to get to Him in a righteous way, and then how to walk with God. Now, all of this takes place over just about a one-month period. This is where the Israelites are at the, the foot of Mount Sinai. They have come there. They've been given the Ten Commandments. They have been promised, God has promised through Moses, that they will be his people. And so the question we then get to when we, when we get into Leviticus is, um, okay, now what do we do with this? You've said we're your people. You've said you're going to be with us as our God. You've said you want us to live righteous unto you, but how are we going to do all this? How does this relationship work? Two key verses, I believe, both from the 20th chapter of Leviticus. Leviticus 27 and 8 says, Consecrate yourself and to be holy. There's the become holy. The sacrificial system to become holy. Because I am the Lord your God. Keep my decrees. Here's the second part. To stay holy. Keep my decrees and follow them. I am the Lord who makes you holy. Holy is, if you pick one word and said, what is the most significant? That's why I call this the way to holiness. It's the word holy. Leviticus, again, in the 20th chapter, the 26th verse says, You are to be holy to me because I, the Lord, am holy, and I have set you apart from the, from the nations to be my God. <coughs> so let's step back and look at this uh, a little bit historically. Um, in the 19th chapter of Exodus, the Israelites camp at the foot of Mount Sinai. God gives them the Ten Commandments. God then begins to expand the understanding of the Ten Commandments in terms of the other laws, mitzvot, commandments, uh, mitzvot as it's called in Hebrew, the commandments that God has for them. Um, and yet, here they are at the foot of Mount Sinai in the desert. It's not God's intention for them to stay there forever. So where do we, it's, it's almost as though the Israelite, the, natural, the Israelites, the natural question was they were saying, okay, where do we go from here? Literally, where do we go from here? Because they were promised to live in Canaan, which is north. But also, where do we go from here in terms of how do we now live out this thing you've told us? You are our God, we are your people. How does that work? Because, you know, you're not like us, we're not like you. What's the means by which we continue to be in a relationship? Um, so, it's also true that the Israelites... Preparing to move into the land of Canaan. They had just left Egypt where they worshipped a whole plethora of gods. They're getting ready to go to Canaan where they worship a whole different plethora of gods. Um, and have various kinds of practices in Canaan that are, were an abomination to God. God says the reason that I am going to drive them out before you is because of the way they act. You know, the gods they worship, they practice child sacrifice. They have ritualized sexual immorality as part of their worship. All of these reasons are why I'm going to drive the Canaanites out in front of you. And by the way, you better not act like that when you get there. And so part of what we have in Leviticus is God is getting very specific in terms of how you are supposed to act so that you don't act like those people. When we get into the laws of what you can eat and not eat, then that was such a... a defined and rigorous kind of expectation for what the Israelites were allowed to eat, they couldn't eat with anybody else. I mean, as this developed into practice over the, the next uh, generations and centuries, it was clear to the Israelites they couldn't walk into a home of somebody who wasn't a Jew and have a meal with them, because there were all sorts of ways in which they could be made unclean by that. So they couldn't eat with anybody else. Well, if you can't eat with somebody else, you're probably not going to end up worshiping with them. Not if you're really obeying the rules. And so some of these rules and regulations were specifically intended to say to the Israelites, you have to be different. 
You can't be like everybody else because I have set you apart of all the nations to be my own. And so some of these things we, we, we look at and go, why in the world did he tell them that? Well, it's because he didn't want them to be like everybody else. And so, you know, de facto, the things he told, that God told the Israelites they should and shouldn't do, some of them kind of sound kind of strange to us because God wanted them to be strange. Strange in the sense of different. Not like everybody else. And therefore, not like something that we readily understand. Okay, does that make sense? Um, so we have the details of worship given in Leviticus. Now, the, the book of Leviticus, the name that we have, the original Greek name for this, when the Septuagint was translated in the, the 250s or so, was Leviticus. When that got translated into Latin by Jerome, into the Latin Vulgate, it became Leviticus. Well, that's where we get Leviticus, and it means pertaining to the Levites. And it's really not a very good name for this book because it suggests this, this whole book is sort of a handbook for the Levitical priests. It's not. That's a common misunderstanding. You will even read commentaries that will say this is a handbook for the Levitical priests to, to show them how it is they're supposed to do sacrifice. There's some general directions in there, but for instance, it nowhere says here's how you're supposed to, to uh, uh, cut up the animals. I mean, it gives you rough, but like, what kind of tools were they supposed to use? Where were they supposed to stand? What were they supposed to say when they were doing all of this? There's, this is not a manual for the priesthood. If it was, there would be a lot more detail involved in that. You know, if you've ever looked at a manual, a minister's manual for any, any uh, Christian uh, denomination, they give you specific words. Here's a prayer you can say for a baptism. And here's, a, you know, here's an order of worship that you can use for uh, establishing a new church or whatever. There's none of that in Leviticus. It is more intended for lay people to understand what's supposed to happen in terms of sacrifice with a little bit of instruction for the priests. So the, the pertaining to the Levites is not really a very good name for this book, but it was the name that was originally given um, in Greek and then Latin, and we inherited that. There is some about the Levitical priests, don't misunderstand, but the Hebrew name for this is Yigra, which means, and he called which, like most of the Hebrew books, are the, is the, the first word of the original Hebrew text. It says, and he called Moses, meaning God. God the Lord called Moses. That's, that's what it will read if you read the first uh, verse in English. And the Lord called Moses and said to him. So, Waika is Hebrew for, and he called. Um, so, this is where we get the name for it. Um, Let's talk about the different sections of this book uh, now and what they say and what they mean to us. I've got like three sets of notes up here. Um, first, the first major division, uh, uh, which is the first seven chapters, are the laws of sacrifice. And they particularly talk about five different kinds of sacrifice or offerings as they're described. There is the burnt offering in which an animal is sacrificed and cut, cut up in pieces and burnt completely. Um, then there is a cereal offering, which is uh, wheat and oil and incense. Then there is a peace offering, which is done on feast days. That is actually not entirely burnt, but it is consumed by the people that offer it. That is the, frequently the offerings in several of the offerings. The person who makes the offering gets most of the stuff back. Now, one way to understand the offerings is there's two basic kinds of offerings, even though there's five different ones. The first three, the burnt offering, the cereal offering, and the peace offering, are all primarily intended to be simply something that is pleasing to God. It's kind of hard for us to imagine, but um, the idea that you burn an animal on a fire and it gives off a scent and that that somehow is pleasing to God. And then the other two the sin offering and the guilt offering are specifically intended not to, because it's pleasing to God, but in order to um, cause expiation for our sin. In other words, to give us atonement, to take away our sin. And the guilt offering and the sin offering are slightly different in terms of how they're done and what the intention behind them are. Well, we may get into that a little bit. It's not that important that we focus too much on it. Now, why in the world did God want them to do this? To sacrifice animals? in order to, in some way, please him, and particularly to um, cause them to have their sins forgiven, or to allow them to have their sins forgiven, perhaps. Prepare them for uh, the sacrifice of Christ. 
Well, to prepare them for the sacrifice of Christ, but I think it's a little more particular than that in terms of the Old Testament. I'm, I'm one that, while I, I believe that, that Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament, I think that the Old Testament had its own, you know, we need to interpret it in its own context as well, because God intended it for the Israelites who lived and died before Jesus came as well. Um, well, let me ask you a question. Now, we're talking about particularly sacrifice as a means by which sin is taken away or expiated or forgiven. If you go out here and you break a law, let's say you break a traffic law, and the people in authority know you did it, they catch you in other words, what do you have to do? Pay. 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 Uh, don't ever pay more data. I strongly recommend you don't. Okay. It, 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 anyway, uh, because every time somebody pays more data, then the next person who gets caught, they expect them to pay more data. Uh, I've been stopped three times, and all three times they suggested they wanted something I didn't, and they let me go. Uh, anyway, off the subject. Uh, the idea is what, when you when you break a law, you're expected to pay a fine, right? That's the standard. Now that fine may be imprisonment, but more often it's that you pay a monetary fine. Um, well, what if you didn't have any money? In fact, what if nobody had any money? The Israelites did not have money. Money was invented, you know, in other parts of the world and, 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 and later mostly. I think the Chinese had money by this time, but that's different. Um, what if your, your capital resources were made up of your herds? The Israelites had always, since the time of Abraham, Abram, they had been hurting people. That's one of the reasons the, the Pharaoh and the Egyptians were, were not too unhappy, or were not unhappy, when Joseph brought the rest of his family down, Jacob and his, his other kids, is because they were herdsmen. And the Egyptians didn't like herding. And they thought that was kind of dirty work. So they were happy. Here's a whole group of people, and they're going to take care of the herds for us. The Israelites had always been a herding people. And like some cultures today, for instance, there are places in Africa where a person's wealth is not measured in in which you have a bank, because they don't bank. It's based upon their herds. And so that was true for the Israelites. So if an Israelite committed a, a, um, a, a punishable offense, they couldn't pay a fine with money, so they were expected to do something else which cost them something. And that was to sacrifice an animal. That was their capital resource. Okay, Does that make sense? They were, they were told, you've done something wrong, you have to pay a fine, and the only thing you have to pay that fine with are animals. Well, so you've got the priests, and you've got this tabernacle, and this is when these people, the Israelites, are traveling across the desert, all right? If everybody was bringing animals to the tabernacle and to the priests who were in charge of the tabernacle, and everybody, when they committed sins or crimes, they were bringing these animals, what do you think would happen pretty quickly? More than you could deal with. There'd be more than you could deal with. All of a sudden, there wouldn't be room for the tabernacle, you know, because the priests had spent all the time trying to feed and clean up after these animals. So the animals were brought as a penalty for having broken a law, much like we pay fines for breaking laws. They couldn't maintain them all, and so they were slaughtered. Part of the food, part of the meat, was given to the priests and, uh, and their families, so they are supported because they're spending all their time with the tabernacle and the law. They don't have time to go out and raise their own herds. <coughs> Part of it goes back to the people who did the sacrifices, particularly thank offerings. When they brought animals for thank offerings and they were butchered, most of the meat went back to the family that made the offering. But there was still a lot of stuff there, particularly stuff you didn't really want to eat. What, what do you do if you want to completely destroy something and get rid of it so that it's not in the way anymore? Burn. You burn it! <laughs> Do you begin to see the sensibility behind this whole sacrificial system? You commit a violation of the law, you have to pay a penalty. They paid in animals. The animals were divided up, but at a certain point, there were big parts of it that had to be destroyed in some way because they couldn't. Okay, the only thing worse than having a herd that you have to follow along is without refrigeration, having more meat than you know what to do with. So it was burned. Okay. Joe. Did human sacrifices also get into this category? No. Uh, Israelites, in fact, human sacrifice was one of the worst of the abominations to the Israelites. Now, you raise a good point, though. 
The Israelites, when we say, man, all these animals, they're killing all these animals and all this blood and everything else, every culture in the ancient Near East used some kind of animal sacrifice as part of their religious system. They all did. In fact, if God had not created a very controlled and very specific way of using animal sacrifice, the Israelites probably would have gone looking for something else because the, the idea that this can't be that different. And so there's some sense in which, how do I say this? Um, God recognizing human nature as it was, since every person had experienced animal sacrifice as part of religious practice, if God did not institute some part of that, then there would have been a disconnect on the part of the people. And I think some of this was a, a, a condescension on God's part to the expectation of the people. Because I, I, Carol and I were watching a TV show one time, and it was, it was a weird TV show, and there was a character on there, and he said um, there was this sort of false god, and he said, we have worshipped this god for far longer than you've even known about them. And the other person said, what do you mean when you say worship? And he said, I mean what has always been meant by worship, sacrifice. There has always been an aspect of sacrifice to give up something of value as part of religious worship. That has always been the case, right? Um, and that's still true today, by the way. The Christian faith, we are expected to give up certain things that we find very pleasurable, for instance, as not being appropriate. So this idea of sacrifice there was animal sacrifice in all of the different areas. The thing was that that sacrifice, and sometimes it included human sacrifice, like the sacrifice to Molech, where they would sacrifice their children. And here in Leviticus, it specifically points out that the abomination of sacrificing your children to Molech, and that the, the answer to that is those people have to be killed if they've sacrificed their children to Molech. A lot of cultures had that. The Polynesian cultures, have you all read Michener's Hawaii? It opens up with the first of the, of the Polynesian people coming to Hawaii. When they land there, the first thing they do is they sacrifice part of the slaves that had rowed all that distance. They didn't get any credit for it. They sacrifice them in order to put their bodies underneath the corner poles of their, of their lodge. There has always been an aspect of human sacrifice in cultures. That was not the case in Israelite culture, except for those cases where they, you know, some of them made the mistake of following Molech. Uh, for instance, Ahab and Jezebel, they were involved in child sacrifice. The North kings of, king and queen of the north of Israel. But, um, and they also used sacrifice, and they talk about that in the book, in other ways, like for occult purposes. And the Israelites did not use sacrifice for occult purposes either. That is, like reading the entrails of a goat kind of stuff. This is not part of the uh, Israelite culture. First Aaron and then Suzanne. Um, I was just wondering what the name of the book was again. Hawaii. Just like the state, it is, it's, it's one of you know Michener's oh, you know, one of these yeah. things. It's like yeah, it's 1,500 pages. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, it's, it's it's even the paperback. It's only that tall, but it's about that wide too. Um, but it starts out. The first chapters have to do with the the first Polynesian peoples coming there, and the first thing they do is they sacrifice you know slaves that had been doing all the rowing. A lot of cultures had had human sacrifice. The Israelites never had. Okay, Suzanne. Uh, I'm not remembering, but in, in Genesis and um, Exodus, well, not Exodus, but yeah, Exodus, they, they, didn't, they didn't have any sacrifices. They didn't do anything, but they, 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 they were always erecting stones where something important happened between right. them and God. Right, as a memorial. As a memorial. Right. Now, there is a sense, um, at, from the Garden of Eden to Noah, everyone was a vegetarian. There was no, um, no indication or even allowance for the killing of animals to eat. After Noah, and you think it's kind of weird because they only had two of each one. Um, actually, they had more than that. There were some animals that they had seven, you know, seven pairs of, not just one, one pair. Well, after Noah, after the ark, God says, it's now okay for you to kill and eat some animals. But in that case, every time an animal was to be killed, it was to be killed as an offering to God. Every time you killed an animal and ate meat, you were to give thanks to God for it, as though it were a special recognition of God's provision for you. There's some, some primitive cultures right now that, who hunt for a living. Um, did you ever see The Gods Must Be Crazy, the movie? Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, there's a scene, I think it's in that movie, there's a scene where he kills an animal, 
And before he, you know, as he kills it, he comes over and he apologizes. I'm really yes. sorry, you know, I had to do this, but I have to feed my family. Well, this idea that there is some special, uh, almost spiritual thing even in that movie happening about killing an animal to eat. Well, with Noah, the instructions are that any time you kill an animal for food, you were supposed to see that as a sacrifice to God. Yes, you eat the meat, but you're supposed. there was a holiness associated with that. And so that continues here. The idea that when animals are killed, it, there's a sense of it being a sacrificial act in all, at all times. In fact, you may have noticed in Leviticus, it forbids the killing of animals apart from the tabernacle uh, setting. So um, there is a sense in which any time you take a life, even of a goat or a sheep or a lamb or a cow, there is something sacred about the taking of that life and the spilling of that blood. And it was never supposed to be done from Noah on, from the very first time that people ate meat, it was never to be done in a way that was not in recognition of the fact that God has done something extraordinary in allowing you to, to gain sustenance from the taking of a life of another creature. Okay? Ron? Don't the Jewish uh, rabbis still oversee the slaughtering of that? Today. Well, they don't oversee the slot. Well, the for uh, kosher law, mm -hmm. a butcher has to be uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Credited. It has to be uh, certified. certified. Certified kosher. They and and, and the rabbis, you know, selected rabbis, trained rabbis, come by on a regular basis and will review and make sure that they are still following cult, uh, the appropriate kosher practices. And if the butcher is meets the, the kosher requirements for certification, then the meat from that can be eaten by uh, conservative Jews. So it's not like they oversee the killing of every animal, but they make sure the people doing it and the, the places they do it and everything else are all according to kosher law. Yes, Ron? My only understanding of kosher is bleeding the animal. Is there more than that? Oh, much more. Uh, you're not allowed to boil a kid in its mother's milk. You, so they don't eat milk and meat together. Um, there can be no yeast associated with it. Uh, a place that is kosher, uh, can, there's, they can't slaughter pigs there. Because any contact with pork, any, anything pig, would be unclean. So there are only certain animals that can be involved in that. And so the, the kosher uh, requirements for certification as fully kosher are very, very specific. And it, it affects not only meats, but other kinds of foods as well. What does kosher mean then? Clean. Kosher means it follows the Jewish law, the dietary law. That's what it means. And it, it's consistent, it it's, follows exactly what the, the requirements of the, the Jewish dietary law are. Okay? Other questions about that? Yes, and Suzanne. Just to comment, I'm seeing this whole time as a time when, from Mount Sinai until they actually entered, and as a time when they could focus just on these sacrifices as, as what God wanted from mm -hmm. them. And had they followed what he told them to do, is to kill everybody in the other land, they would have had just this to focus on still, and not not the other. What the Canaanites did. Exactly. Well, that's the point. Is you're supposed to be like this, not like the Canaanites. Um, and yet they, you know, they wandered off for various reasons. Particularly, they found the Canaanite. You know, the, the Hebrew men found the Canaanite women especially attractive, and that got them in all kinds of trouble, um, and including Solomon. You know, no, no less than Solomon. He fell from, from God's grace because he married foreign wives and then not only allowed them to worship the gods, but encouraged other people to. Apparently, he set up a temple to one of the worst of the Canaanite gods right outside the wall of Jerusalem, Solomon did. So, um, yeah, they fell into that, and God saw the danger of that, and that's one of the reasons why he created a system which, had it been followed, would almost have isolated them from any of those outside influences, either from previous in Egypt or from Canaanite. And remember, when they worshipped the golden calf, the indication is that the reason why it was a golden calf is because one of the, the favorite gods in Egypt had been Hathor, who was in the form of cow. And so they had carried some of that stuff with them and already had broken you know, covenant with God by worshiping a golden calf. And the danger was they would do the same thing, even worse, in Canaan. And sure enough, that's what they did, despite God's efforts to try to give them a path that they could stay on and that would keep them away from that. John? Ross, you may touch this in just a moment, this, uh, but I have a question, and you may not want to answer right now. You may answer later on. Okay. 
But we're talking about how it, this is the way to holiness. Define holiness. What is holy then? Is it, is it moral excellence or is it being separated as a people or is it both? Right. One would have, have to have, uh, one would almost have to stretch to find out how ceremonial activities like this add to moral excellence. Right. You know, so, so maybe you could define Yeah, well, let me talk about that right now. I mean, I was going to get into that, but this is a good time to talk about it. Um, our usual definition of holy and holiness is not what Leviticus is talking about. The idea of moral excellence, of being good, that's not what holiness is here. Holiness, uh, to be holy, is almost literally, it is the character of God. It has nothing to do with morality, per se. Although, the way you try to stay close to that is by being moral. Let me explain that. Holiness is the godness of God. It is the nature of God to be holy. And so the goal is, if we are to be in relationship with God, if, which means if we are to draw near to God, then we have to be as pure as we can be. We have to, the, the closer we are to God, then the more of the holiness of God that we are able to take on. The further away from God we get, the less holiness. And if we get away from God, and we are not holy, and we try to re-enter into the presence of God, then we are in danger of destruction. And it talks about that. You know, if uh, people who enter wrongly, um, you get the story of two, Aaron's two sons, you know, who the suggestion is, it talks about illicit fire, if you, in one translation, it sounds as though what they had done is they took it upon themselves to start burning incense, perhaps to another god, or at least without the idea that this was in recognition of the holiness of God, and God annihilated them. You know, he, he killed them with fire instantaneously because they were defying the holiness of God. So, let me try to draw that together. If holiness is the, is the godness of God, it's the character of God, it's the nature of who God is, then, and, and he wants to be in a relationship with these people, then they need to try to become as holy as possible in order that the holier you are, the closer you get. This is why, since God lived in the Holy of Holies, he lived in the inner sanctuary of the tabernacle. You know, he, he literally resides above the, the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant, he says. The only person who's allowed in that room, and even then, only once a year, is the person who is supposed to be the holiest of all, the one who is closest to God, the one who is most godly, and that is the high priest. Nobody else was allowed. And it wasn't because he was the only person who was morally righteous, or the only person who was good, or the only person who was trying. It's because he was the one that God had said, I'm going to let you be the one closest to me. And so by being closer to God, he's made more holy, and by being more holy, he's allowed to be closer to God. Okay, It's almost this, a circular thing there. But holiness means to be more like God, to have more of the character of God. It really, but the thing is, what can take you away from the character of God? Violating His will, doing anything that is contrary to the nature of God. And so the book of Leviticus is a list of things. Here's what you can do to be more like me and closer to me. And here's a list of things that if you do them, you are going to be further away from me and therefore less holy. And the more you do that makes you less holy, the less access to me you're going to have. And the ultimate danger for the Israelites was that if they as a people proved to be thoroughly unholy, not seeking to be like God, in relationship with God, then at some point God might leave. That was always their fear, that if they offended God so much, he might choose to leave them. you remember what happened when um, the people, the golden calf scene, God said, first, I'm going to destroy these people. And Moses pleaded with God, please don't do that. And God said, fine, I will send an angel with you, but I am not going to go with you anymore. You are not going to have my presence with you. And again, Moses pleaded with God and said, no, please don't take your presence away from us. Stay with us. And he kept asking him until God finally said, okay, I will stay with you. And so the book of Leviticus is... You guys have already, God saying, you guys have already proven that you've got an in, in, uh, a strong inclination not to be righteous before me, not to be willing to take on my holiness, to be holy as I am holy, at least sufficient for me to be in relationship with you. So let me give you very clear instructions as to how you have to act. First, the sacrificial system will make you holy by taking away your sin. You know, I'll, I'll, 
move you to the front of the line right away with sacrifice. Then you have a responsibility to stay close to me by acting the way I tell you to act, to remain holy, to remain godly. You know, we use the word godly, of the character of God, as almost synonymous with holy, right? That's very accurate to what the book of Leviticus says. Does that make sense? Holiness does not necessarily mean morally correct or good. It means more godly, acting more like God. And God, it's, it's actually gracious of him to have given us very specific instructions. I had a friend who, wants, who used to say, I need a list. I just got to have a list. Give me a list. Let me check stuff off and then I'll know I'm okay. Well, in a very real way, that's what God is doing here. He's saying, let me tell you all the stuff you need to do and the things you need to not do in order for, to be okay with me, in order to be more godly, in order to be more holy. So, and the better you are at that, the closer we can be because I am a holy God. One, one can see now real clearly the accessibility that Jesus gave us mm -hmm. to that holiness and his whole role as coming as Messiah. And in paying the price for us. It's imputed to us and opened to us that we might live in this, mm -hmm. which the Israelites had a lot of difficulty doing. Yeah, and there, there is still sacrifice required. But the sacrifice that was made that was a perfect sacrifice was sufficient for all time and did not need to be repeated. You know, very simply, God said, when you sin, um, there's a price to be paid for you to have that sin removed. And the price for sin is death. You know, and it's your death. But because I'm a merciful God, I will allow you to replace your blood and your death with the blood and death of an animal. You're going to still have to pay a price because the animals were their life, right? That's how they lived. You're still going to have to pay a price. And in fact, that price has to be the very best you can make it. That's why the animals had to be spotless. They had to be perfect, as perfect as possible. And so it has to be a spotless lamb. But when, when the sacrifice was made, even though that animal might look perfect, it wasn't really perfect. And so because it wasn't perfect, that sacrifice had to be repeated. And repeated, and repeated, and repeated. Because the sacrifice that was done in, on, in our place wasn't sufficiently perfect in order to completely clear us of our obligation, the payment, the penalty we had to pay for our sin. Well, then when a sacrifice that was perfect was provided on our behalf, that lasted forever. It didn't have to be repeated because it really was spotless. It was without blemish. Jesus was the perfect Lamb of God. And because of His perfection, it doesn't have to be repeated because we continue to sin. It is sufficient to cover us in the future. Would, would, okay. you, excuse me, would you say then that today our price that we pay uh, is one of ultimate surrender to the one who gave his life for us? Yeah, we have to accept the, the redemption, the expiation that that sacrifice makes. But remember, it's the New Testament says the wages of sin are death. It's exactly what the Old Testament said. The price of sin is death. It's your death for sinning. But God, being a merciful God, will allow you a substitute. It has to be the best substitute you can, but because even that's not perfect, it has to be repeated until the perfect comes. The wages of sin are death, but the gift of God, okay, um, the, the gift of God was given for us in terms of the sacrifice once for all. Okay. Yes? Does this begin to make more sense to you, by the way, yes. if you understand the sacrificial yes. system? Um, I think one thing that's confusing to me is that um, the sacrifices were to atone for their sins. Mm -hmm. That's one of the reasons. Okay, one of the reasons, yes. Uh, but not completely. Mm -hmm. So what is the part not completely? Because it wasn't a perfect sacrifice. So it didn't really, how much was removed from them? How much sin was removed from them? Right. How much guilt? Well, if... If at the Day of Atonement, the high priest had poured out the blood on the mercy seat for the people, and they had not sinned again, then they would have been fine. They wouldn't have had to sacrifice again. But how long do you think after that 
pouring of blood it was before the people started sinning again. 60 seconds. Milliseconds, okay. <laughs> and so that's the nature of it. If you say you're without sin, you're a liar, and the truth is not in you. Yes. And when John wrote that, he was writing to Christians. Okay? We continue to sin. We continue to fail. We're supposed to do the best we can, but knowing that, and in fact, the fact that God gave us a, a mean, gave the Israelites a means by which, knowing they were going to continue to fall short, they were going to continue to miss the mark, they were going to continue to fail in, in following God, that He gave them a means by which they could continue to be forgiven, is a grace. That's a mercy. He could at any time have said, I am tired of you people, like He did you know, to Moses when they saw when the golden calf thing. At any time, He could have said, okay, that's enough. We're not going to do this anymore. You guys, I'm tired of you screwing up. But even, no matter how bad it got, he always strikes them back. You know, he, re he, he punishes them, he reestablishes the covenant agreement, and he takes them back. There is always that mercy until finally the ultimate, the only perfect sacrifice was made in Jesus Christ that satisfied the same expectations. But the very fact that, is, as weird as this sounds to us when we read it, there are very specific reasons why God did this, and it's because of his mercy because of his desire to give us a specific means by which we could be made whole again. All right? Now. Question again. Sure. Okay. Uh, and, and you have said this. Um, the, uh, the laws were made, uh, and God wanted these people to be set apart right. for him. So. Anything that is set apart for God is considered holy mm -hmm. um, or consecrated to God. So could we say that holiness also means to be set apart for God? There, there's a, a slight error in that. Okay. I mean, when we say holy to be set apart from God, um, it's possible that we could say something is set apart from God and it not be holy. It has to be. Holiness is not is not something we do. Holiness is only something that is, is um, given by God. by God. Only as things approach God are they made holy. Days were made holy because God ordained it. All right? So nothing is holy apart from God's act of making it holy because it is literally Him imparting part of His nature on something. Now, we can set something aside and say, God, we give this to you. This is our sacrifice, our offering, or whatever to you. And God is a gracious God, and He will receive it, and He will impart holiness to it. But it's not because we've done anything. Yes. It has to be because God has given it some of His character, which is, by definition, what holiness is. Okay? So, uh, other people are critical of this. It's interesting. I, look, I, I always go online and do searches and stuff, and there's a skeptic's website. And I looked on the skeptic's website for what they uh, thought about Leviticus, and I started out by saying, first, don't read Leviticus. <laughs> Nobody does anyway, and so it's not going to help. <laughs> okay. Well, we do, actually. Thank you very much. And it's because they missed the whole point of Leviticus. You know, it's not the gory details. It's the larger. And, for instance, one of the things that skeptics always say is, what kind of cheap God is it that wants you to come and offer him gifts, offer him sacrifice? What kind of pagan thing is that? As though that demonstrating our love, our devotion to God by bringing Him gifts is somehow cheapening. Um, G.K. Chesterton talks about, on this very topic, he says, oh yeah, humans aren't like that. I mean, we wouldn't think of, as a, as a sign of our love and devotion, giving, let's say, a golden ring to an object of our devotion, or, oh, I don't know, beautiful plants like flowers, or um, savory uh, or uh, sweet, uh, special treats like chocolates. Mm. And he draws this image. Uh, Carol and I watched a TV show the other night. There was a guy in an airport waiting for it, actually his ex-wife who he wants to get back together with. And he's standing there waiting for her. And he's got a huge bunch of roses, and it's in Hawaii. And he's got lays over his arm, and he's got a bunch of balloons, and he's got a big <laughs> box of chocolates. Why do we think that there is something foreign about us showing our love and devotion for another, another, another creature, another being, by giving them gifts, offerings, tokens of our affection? We do that all the time. Why should we think that there is something foreign about doing that for God? Does that make sense? Yes. 
There is something built into us to say that if you really love someone, if you feel a sense of devotion to them, you want to give them gifts. That's part of our makeup. Well, that is no less part of what our response to God should be. Now, yeah, we may not understand why it is that a burning bowl on an open fire is an aroma that is, you know, is pleasing to God. But he said that's what he likes. You know? If Carolyn said, she, you know, she really likes jalapeno ice cream, I may not understand that. <laughs> but I may, I may give it to her as, a, as an act of devotion, right? And that sounds like something she probably would like. Okay? <laughs> we had, we, in New Zealand, we had jalapeno and pepper ice cream. Oh, so, so, part of it is, I want us to understand that as foreign as this sounds to us, it really does make sense. People committed violations, they had to pay fines, what they paid, they had no money, they paid with the thing that they had, which is animals. The animals were shared with the priests because they needed to be taken care of too, and the people got part of it back. The animals that were sacrificed, uh, no refrigeration. You know, part of it was burned because that was how you destroyed it, so you didn't have all these live flocks, you know, following the tabernacle. The idea that one of the aspects of the offering is that to give gifts as acts of devotion and love for somebody we really have feelings for, a being we really have feelings for, is very consistent. All of this stuff begins, if we just step back and go and look at parallels in our own experience and in our own character, this is not inconsistent, even though it sounds so horribly foreign to us. There is a reason to it. And particularly, the idea is that these things were done for our sake, to give us a specific process by which we could have our sins forgiven and by which we could be reconciled back to God. Okay. You know, it... Yes, John. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to put it out. It, it not only does those things, I would see it too as being a... a... Uh, a, a point of centrality of a society, you know, that this, this, does all those things that you mentioned with the Lord, but one of the side effects would be drawing a society into community, into a unity, a distinct group of people, right. and it does all those dynamics of creating this, this healthy, uh, uh, Community that cares for one another, that is following by laws and, and so on. Well, and that's when we talk about the fact that it, it was it was so different. It separated them from the other people, de facto. You know, the other other side of that coin is it drew them together as a person. The obedience to the law was the thing that kept the Israelites as a unique people throughout all of their age, and it's the thing that even when they, most of them wandered off, they still had that, and they could come back to it. They had some place to come back to, and that was the law. And that's why the law has always been held as the center point of what it meant to be Jew. Um, so, so you've got the laws on sacrifice in the first seven chapters, and they're really it's broken up in two parts. First, there's from the point of view of the person doing the sacrificing, that is the individual, and then it talks about it from the point of view of the priest. And again, this isn't even though it's the name of the book is is regarding the Levites. It's not just from the priestly point of view. In fact, there's more of it from the the point of view of the the person bringing the sacrifice you know, to the tabernacle than there is from the priestly point of view. The second aspect then is the installation and ordination of priests. The very specific idea that there is a people, um, a priestly group that is being set aside for God to serve God. Um, and there, there actually are two different categories of priests that come up here. There are the Aaron and his sons, that is the family of Aaron, which are the, the Levitical priests that are responsible for maintaining the sacrificial system at the tabernacle. Later on, the descendants of Aaron were the ones that maintained the sacrificial system in the temple. But then you have all the other members of the tribe of Levi, since this has to do with the Levites, which in Ezekiel, they, they identify these two categories. They're the sacrificial priests, the sons of Aaron, and Ezekiel calls the others the sort of general, you know, they, they're the ones that went, I'm sure, and gathered the wood or, you know, carried off the, you know, the ashes and did all the other kind of work. Um, they are called the sons of Zadok in Ezekiel. But they were still of the tribe of Levi, but not of the family of Aaron. So there's like a high priest uh, class, 
that do the actual sacrificing, and the, and the high priest of the line of Aaron is the one who goes into the Holy of Holies once a year on the Day of Atonement and pours the sacrifice on the, the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. Um, and so there's that, that group, and then there are the, the general Levitical priests of the line of Levi. Um, the second section here, chapters 8 through 10, give very specific instructions as to how it is that the Levites are supposed to be um, ordained, the process that they're supposed to go through in order for them to be prepared to serve the Lord. Now, it is Moses that leads them through this. Uh, Moses is the one who does the ordaining, and it takes seven days to go through the very complex ordination process, at least for Aaron and his sons. It's after they've gone through that seven day, um, in, in the book of Leviticus, after they've gone through that seven days process of ordination, the glory of God actually makes a direct appearance. The sacrificial pieces have been laid out on the altar, and at the end of that time, the glory of God actually falls on and consumes the animals rather than them having to set a fire under it as a sign of the fact that God is very present with those who have been ordained. We immediately have the very tragic and scary scene where Nadab and Abihu, uh, apparently two of Aaron's younger sons, he had four sons, uh, his two younger sons um, decide on their own volition, of their own will, that they're going to burn incense. And we don't, doesn't give us a lot of detail. We don't know exactly what the motivation was behind that. As I say, the word illicit is a good translation when they talk about the kind of fire, in, the fire on incense it was. The suggestion is that they may have been actually trying to sacrifice to a false god, or they may have been simply presuming that they could, they could make the call. I was reminded in that. Uh, in fact, one commentary I read said, why was this such a big deal? Because other people sacrificed throughout the whole Old Testament. Well, not really. Not unless they were given special permission. Specifically, you'll remember that Saul, like the last straw that King Saul did, was he had been waiting for Samuel to show up. Samuel, who was a prophet and the priest of God, the one who had the right to provide the sacrifice. Samuel was getting ready to fight a battle, and he, or Saul was, I'm sorry, and, and he's waiting, 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 and Samuel's not showing up, and some of his guys are getting so tired of waiting, they want to go home. So Saul takes it upon himself to burn the sacrifice before God himself, and just as he's doing that, Samuel shows up and says, what are you doing? You don't have the right to do that. So it may have even been, even if they weren't worshiping or, or burning incense to a foreign god, it may have been that the two of... Uh, Aaron's younger sons were presuming that they had just been ordained. They now have the right authority to decide what's going to happen and when it's going to happen. And they start taking, uh, taking upon themselves uh, this right, or they, they thought a right, this, this responsibility in the way that Saul did. And this is the thing that finally caused God to, to uh, expel Saul as the king of Israel and have David anointed. It's right after this that God tells Samuel, you know, you need to anoint another king. And he goes off and finds the youngest son of Jesse, uh, David, and anoints him. And then years, it's years later that he actually becomes king. But in the same way, these two sons apparently had taken it upon themselves to do something that was not their right to do. They may have been feeling, you know, feeling uppity. They just, they just got ordained as a high priest of God. Or not high priest. As a, as a priest of God, the erotic priest of sacrifice and all that. Great, we can do whatever we want. Not so much. If anything, the priests are held to a higher standard. You will remember that it, it, from your reading, I'm sure you guys spent a lot of time really reading closely Leviticus and studying all this stuff, that when the, uh, when the time came for the sin offering, the priest, the Aaronic priest, the priest of Aaron, uh, the family of Aaron, was supposed to sacrifice a bull for his own sins and a goat for the sins of everybody else. Well, now, a bull's a lot bigger than a goat, more expensive, fewer of them. And the idea was that the sins of the high priest were worse because of the fact that he was supposed to be holy. That there was more required of him than of everybody else. Very consistent with the New Testament says that, you know, be careful lest you, if you want to teach because those who teach will be held to a higher standard. Same thing is true. Those who were supposed to be priests were going to be held to a higher standard. And because the two sons of Aaron did this, Whatever exactly it was, it was not in God's will, he had to make a very strong point. Let me be real clear about this. 
and he does a very tragic and dramatic thing. Uh, fortunately, Aaron had two other sons. And there's a very moving passage in there when after this happens and Moses is declaring what has happened, there's this little line, it says, and Aaron was silent. Did you read that? Yeah. He just lost two of his sons. So it was a very serious thing and very tragic, but God is very serious about this. You don't play around with this stuff. <coughs> John? The English Standard Version translates that as unauthorized fire. Yeah. Yeah, unauthorized. Some people say illicit. You know, some translations. Yeah. So it was. It at least was not something God wanted them to do, and at worst, it was something that they were incorporating false worship into the thing. So it was a very serious thing, and it, it actually is a reminder, or it's a sort of a an echo or a pre, uh, precursor to that also scary and tragic scene in Ananias and Sapphira in the book of Acts, where they lie to God, try to lie to God, they lie to the people, uh, saying that here's all the money for this property we bought, trying to take credit for giving everything, when in fact they had retained some for themselves. And like, like the two sons of Aaron, Ananias and Sapphira are stricken dead um, because they had tried to dishonor God by lying about this in order to get credit for it. Okay? So, the ordination, the installation and ordination of priests, a very high, critically important thing, and proven to be critically important because two of the first of uh, the priests, two of the sons of Aaron, were killed by being false to that call of ordination. All right? Um, let's take a break. Right? Established in the first part of Leviticus, uh, in the first uh, ten chapters, the sacrifice to make people holy, the priesthood to pursue the continued system of sacrifice, then we get to the third section, which is chapters 11 to 15, which identifies things that are clean and unclean. The clear connection, thanks Samuel, is made between purity and impurity. And in some ways, when we talk about clean and unclean, and we wonder what that is, if we, if we think in terms of holiness being connected to purity. Uh, so purity and impurity. And the third section talks about first, clean and unclean food and clean and unclean animals. Talks about the uncleanness that is caused by the giving of birth. It deals with various kinds of uh, infectious skin diseases and also contaminated garments and contaminated houses. And then discharge from <coughs> genitals, both male and female, as being ways in which things are made unclean. I read through that and again, Recognizing that this is 3,000 years almost before the concept, concept of contagion in diseases, that there are germs and then later viruses that cause diseases to be passed on, and yet there's a very clear indication here that they had a very clear idea that contact with somebody who was suffering from one of these diseases is how you got them. That's the concept of contagion that didn't come for almost 3,000 years later. Um, you wonder why it took various of the scientists uh, all the way up to Louis Pasteur. You know, Louis Pasteur sort of refined this, but there were ideas uh, 300 years before Pasteur even that this this was probably the case. Uh, Rob, uh, when they talked about or wrote about mold, how to treat mold. Exactly, that's another thing. It, was that ever clear? But it's not. Good. It's. It, I can remember when people first started recognizing if you have black mold in your house, yes. that can make you really sick, yes. right? Yes. Yeah. Leviticus <laughs> talks about. You know, having mildew, which is mold, basically, you know, in your house, how serious that is as a problem and what you do to, you know, to try to treat it. And if that doesn't work, then there's a secondary level. And if finally, if you can't get rid of it, rather than live in that house, you tear it down, start all over again. They recognized so much back then. There is a very practical aspect to this stuff, which is 3,000, 4,000 years ahead of its time. Well, not 4,000, you know, 3,000, 3,500 years ahead of its time. Um, which is, to me, quite extraordinary. And if, if anything, it shows that the hand of God was on this. Uh, people say, well, why are some of these animals clean and some of them are unclean? Well, it's because some animals aren't clean. You know, there are some animals that are prone to disease. Um, and we all know, I, 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 it's only been very recently that they've gotten really, really overcome the problem of trichinosis in pork. You know about trichinosis? Yes. It is a worm. You eat... A, a, a pork that isn't cooked well enough, and it, they used to have this fear. They say that there's almost no trichinosis left in pork unless it's a really, you know, you're in some uh, undeveloped part of the world. Um, the idea was that pork, there were real dangers with pork. 
And so that may be one of the reasons that pork wasn't allowed. Um, the idea of, uh, some, some scholars have said that as they look at the list of unclean animals, that there may be a relationship that unclean animals are animals that tended to want to infringe on people. In other words, they represented the wild trying to take over civilization. Things like rats and insects and uh, owls and other birds that try to nest in people's homes and in barns and things like that. That there may be a line drawn there that, that the book of Leviticus is indicating when it talks about clean and unclean, pure and impure, that there's even a parallel perhaps to civilized and uncivilized, or in other words, the civilized world of humanity and the wild in which bad things can happen and that there needs to be a line drawn between them. Um, so there are all sorts of reasons. We don't understand all of the details about, well, some, some of these animals are on there. Like, you know, you can eat locusts, but you can't eat any other four-legged insects. Okay, Locusts and grasshoppers and crickets. Uh, there have been a few crickets I wanted to stomp in the middle of the night, but I never <laughs> wanted to eat one. Okay. But locusts were standard food. I mean, you remember that John the Baptist lived on locusts and wild honey, for instance. So they were eaten back then. Um, nowadays, the only Westerners who eat them are people who are on Survivor. <laughs> but you get the idea that there are very specific intentions behind this stuff. And that some of the sanitary laws. And you go, well, why not so much detail? Again, in the same way that we think about the fact that if, if we think about modern times, that we have to pay fines or penalties when we commit violations of the law and can see parallels here, there are purity laws that exist in our modern cultures. You know, a restaurant gets shut down because they don't have the right kind of cleanliness standards. Public urination is a, break, is a violation of the law. Why? Because it's not healthy for everybody else. Besides which, it's just kind of gross. Yes. Okay? No, not Mexico. So, but again, when we think about the fact that even in modern times, in modern countries, we have a, a whole long list of various kinds of customs and laws that regulate things like the purity of food and what's allowed to be eaten and what's not, and the disposal of waste and all kinds of other things. So when we look at this and we say, this just sounds kind of weird, well, back up, folks. We've got our own list, and it may be different than this one, but it's not in principle. Uh, it, they may be different in detail, but it's not different in kind. And in that way, this is an early precursor to civilized laws, being concerned about things being contaminated, being concerned about things being impure or not, not healthy to eat, etc., etc. And we have very similar things today. They may not be exactly the same list, but they're very similar. Um, and so we need to recognize that there's a practicality to this. And again, somebody who has, who has what sounds like gonorrhea, you know, discharge from the genitals, is forbidden to spit. That sounds like somebody understood the principle behind contagious disease. Yes, John? You think they understood that, though? Well, God understood it. Exactly. The, the, the marvel of this thing is that he gives them these laws. And I would, I would think, I, would, I may be wrong, right, I would think that he just, okay, he said it, we'll do it. But and well, that's very much what he didn't really understand it. And through the evolution of that thing, they probably came to understand more and more. Yeah, I, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting that the early Israelites were sophisticated epidemiologists. Uh, I'm saying that God knew what was healthy and not healthy, and he instructed them, and they said, well, God said it, so we better do it. Yeah. And it wasn't for almost 3,000 years in the future before we really understood why that made sense. But the fact that we read this, we have to say there's something special going on here. You know, this is not just um, you know, step on a crack, break your mama's back kind of stuff. This isn't just crazy little rules because somebody made it up. There's more going on behind this than we want to give it credit for or that the culture wants to give it credit for. Um, it's also true, and I think this is critically important, that when a person became unclean, because with the, the, the regulations of pure and impure, clean and unclean, that you could become unclean. There are various degrees of uncleanness, each of which has a, um, a process by which you can overcome it. If you are unclean because you, you touch the body of a dead animal, well, wash your hands, Wash yourself, duh. Okay, 
Today, we have to have signs up in bathrooms saying, wash your hands after you use the toilet. Well, do we think it's so weird that they said if you've been unclean by touching a dead animal, wash yourself, and then wait till evening, and when evening comes, which is the start of the next day, then you're clean, you're okay again. If it is a slightly more serious thing, then it may be that you, you, know, you wash yourself, you wash your clothes, and you may be unclean for seven days. Or a woman, for instance, uh, who has a period, she's unclean for seven days. If she, and this is kind of weird, if she gives birth to a son, she's unclean for 40 days. If she gives birth to a daughter, she's unclean for 80 days. Because girls are twice as dirty as boys. I don't know why that is, but that was the rule, okay? Um, and so, but there was a process by which no matter what had happened to you, you could be made clean again. All of this detail about if you have a suggestion of a skin disease, and, when, and they're thinking there, leprosy being the ultimate bad, bad news in terms of a skin disease, but it could have been something else. There are other, and you'll notice that the modern translations even call it an infectious skin disease. How, how did they know about infectious back then? And they would, they would quarantine them. If somebody has what looks like it could be an infectious skin disease, they would be quarantined for seven days. They go to the priest, the priest looks at it, if it looks, and they give a description. If the hairs have been turned white and it appears to be deeper than just the surface, then the person gets quarantined for seven days, and then the priest looks at it again. And they give specific descriptions of how he decides, okay, no, it's nothing, you can go back home. Or no, this is more serious, it's gonna take more time to figure this out. The only example of uh, the not having a, a, a definitive or a defined time period by which uncleanness can be resolved is an infectious disease, skin disease especially, and here they're thinking primarily of leprosy, I believe, uh, in which when a person's put in isolation until the disease goes away, leprosy doesn't go away. We have cures for it now, but although leprosy, Hansen's disease, still exists around the world, <laughs> Caroline's not here. Um, when, she, when she was in elementary school in science class, and they were reading about leprosy, the teacher said, I would prefer that you refer to it as Hansen's disease. And Carolyn said, I'd rather you call it leprosy. The last name is Hansen, in case you didn't get that. Um, so, but the idea is that that was a case where, and this followed through to Jesus' time, if somebody had leprosy, if somebody had a, an infectious skin disease that, that was not curable, that would not go away, then they were condemned to a life of being alone or with other lepers, but not in the general populace. And that was the most horrendous thing that could happen to somebody. But the point was, it was done as hard as that was, as once somebody had a, a disease, leprosy or something equivalent of it, to isolate them for the protection of the rest of the people. It is a very sensible kind of approach. And there was every, every possible effort made up prior to that decision to see if we couldn't do something to bring them back into the community. It was very gracious. In fact, the fact that there's, in every case, there's some means by which a person could be made clean again is a sign of grace. It's like God came up with every possible way he could to bring people back into the community and not have it be something that would cause them to be an outcast. Mary. Were there a special group of people that were assigned to uh, burying dead bodies or cleaning up the battlefield? That would make them unclean, but... It, it would. Um, in all likelihood, that would have been part of the job of this, the, uh, the non-sacrificing priests, or the, you know, the, the sons of Zadok, as Ezekiel called them, meaning not the sons of Aaron that did the sacrificing of the animals, because there was more concern about them remaining clean. But the, there was a, anybody could have done that, and then have gone through the, the process of becoming clean again. Again, you touch the dead body. There are even instructions that... Uh, anyone other than the high priest is not supposed to touch a dead body unless it's a close relative. And if it is a relative, then they're allowed to touch that body and then wash themselves and be clean. In other words, the rule was you shouldn't be touching dead bodies. But if it's an immediate relative of yours, then you have to take care of them. And, it's, and you should do that. And here's how you then become clean after that. Right? The high priest was restricted from touching any dead bodies to the extent that he was able. Um, I can't imagine a situation where you would be forced to touch a dead body, but I, there might be one somewhere, you know, one falls on you or something. Uh, but the, um, there was, it was allowable for anyone to do it um, in terms of 
like the two sons of Aaron when they died. All of a sudden, you've got two cadavers, you've got two dead bodies right there, in the, you know, in front of the tabernacle, you know, in the courtyard. Yes. Somebody had to dispose of those. It was probably the other Levitical priests who were not the other sons of Aaron who did that. Okay, but we don't know that for a fact. Okay. So, again, we get the sense in which this ritual purity was for the benefit of the people, but it also was in order to separate Israel in, in almost every way imaginable. What they ate, how they acted, um, what they allowed themselves to do from everybody else. And as I said before, the laws of clean and unclean food, kosher food, it's very difficult. I think God was saying, I don't want you relating to the Canaanites because talk about a bad influence. You know, they are going to be a bad influence. When God restricted even what they could eat, He was doing everything possible to make sure that they did not associate too closely with the people that they were going to meet when they went into the land of Canaan. That's part of what's going on here. It was, a, it was an intentional act by God to separate them, to make them a people apart. Both to make them, have given them a sense of community as a people, but also to try to protect them from the influences that would come to them when they went into Canaan. And unfortunately, many of them violated the expectations of Levitical law and ended up paying the price for it. Okay, um, okay we had already talked about holiness and what that means. Um, so, the laws of ritual purity promoted and honored life, health, and holiness. These are very civilized ideas. This was a time in history when there wasn't a whole lot of civilization around. If you think of civilization as being a regard for human life and a sense in which, you know, you need to, to take care of yourself and that you have responsibility to be clean, you know, and to be, to, uh, to be as healthy as you can be. The idea of my body being the temple of the Holy Spirit, which comes in the New Testament, the idea that, there, that how I treat my body makes a difference, even a spiritual difference, the old idea that cleanliness is next to godliness is very true, according to Leviticus and everything since then. That impurity, spiritual impurity, in a, in a very real way can be tied to physical impurity. And so you need to be concerned about that. The opposite of holiness is illness and pollution and death, ultimately death. When God is described as the living God, there is inherent in that the idea that life is, you know, is imbued with holiness and death is the opposite of that. And so a lot of these ritual laws were trying to encourage um, health, cleanliness, life, as opposed to sickness and pollution and death. Okay? And we need to see the value in that. And I think we can appreciate that today um, in terms of what we understand as being, you know, you've got to keep yourself clean if you're going to be healthy. You've got to... Certain things you shouldn't do if you want to be healthy and alive. And those things are necessary in order for you to be holy before God. Okay? So, the next thing we run into is there's one chapter which deals with the Day of Atonement, which is kind of a summing up of, the, of what you do to become clean if you become unclean. Once a year, and it is the day of Yom Kippur, it was the most important single day in the Hebrew calendar back then, and it is still today. Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, is the most important day in the <coughs> Jewish calendar. Um, on the Day of Atonement, the high priest would take off all of his fancy gear, you know, the jeweled breastplate, the ephod, and the turban with the, you know, the medallion on it, and all that kind of stuff. The Urim and Thummim. You guys read about the Urim and Thummim? We have no real idea what that is. We don't really know. The best indication we have about the Urim and Thummim is that they were, actually the Hebrew is pronounced Tumim, um, is that the, the, the names, the actual words, mean light and, uh, and holiness kind of thing. It's believed that they may have been symbols of right and wrong, good and bad, you know, um, light and dark. And it talks about putting them in the breastplate, not on, but in. The suggestion has been made, and I think it's probably accurate, that there may have been a pouch or something on the breastplate, the ephod that the high priest wore, in which he placed two stones or tiles or something of that sort, and that in times of decision, you remember in the New Testament when they were trying to select a, 
a replacement for Judas Iscariot, they cast lots. You know, they whittled it down to the best decision they had. It was between two people, and they cast lots between Matthias and uh, Bar Barsabbas. Is that right? I think that's right. And they chose Matthias by casting lots. Well, this wasn't gambling. It wasn't, you know, it, it wasn't some sort of uh, fortune telling. It was simply you bring it down to God and say, okay, God, you make the final decision. Well, it's believed that the Urim and uh, Tumum may have been exactly that, like two tiles or two stones that were in a pouch or something in the breastplate of the high priest. And when the time came where they whittled it down and the final decision was up to God, he would reach in and pull one of them out, and that would decide the decision. It's called cleromancy. It's to use tiles or dice or you know sticks or whatever, uh, some, some, uh, some thing, in order to make a decision about stuff. Cleromancy. Um, and it's believed that's what they were, but we don't absolutely know for sure. Okay? But the idea was the high priest on the day of atonement would take all of that off, he would put on a simple linen robe with linen underwear. They even wore underwear back then. Talk about civilized. Um, and he would go into the Holy of Holies. Well, they would sacrifice the bull. Uh, he would go into the Holy of Holies and pour the blood on the mercy seat, the top of the Ark of the Covenant, right at the place where God dwelt. You know, it's, it, we were told that God's presence dwelt, the holiness of God, dwelt right above the seat of mercy. And so he literally was putting the blood right where God was. And at the same time, another part of the process on the Day of Atonement, which again is kind of mysterious to us, you all know the expression scapegoat. Oh yeah, you know, you got scapegoated on that one. That's a biblical term and a biblical idea. In addition to pouring out the blood on the mercy seat, um, they would take a goat. Actually, they would start with two goats. And they would, they would draw lots, maybe that Urim and, and Tumen. They would decide by drawing lots which of the goats was to be sacrificed and which would be the scapegoat. The high priest would sacrifice the goat, pour the blood on the, on the mercy seat, and the other goat he would place his hands on, and through some words we don't know, he would uh, give the sins of the people, in effect, uh, to that goat to carry. And then the goat would be sent off, actually led off. There was a man responsible to take the goat off into the desert. The mysterious part about this is that in the original, it talks about being sent off to Azazel. Some scholars have said Azazel may have been perceived as the demon of the desert. That, in other words, people's sin came from, from the, the spirit of evil, the devil. And so when they put the sins on the scapegoat, they sent him off to the, the demon or the devil that lived in the desert, that it was symbolic of sending the sins back to where they came from, back to the devil. It may be that that's just a word we don't know that stood for scapegoat. <laughs> Um, we really don't know. There are still some things in here that are kind of mysterious to us. Uh, but that idea that this scapegoat, the sins of the people were placed on it and have sent off into the desert you know, to carry the sins away from camp, away from the people, um, is part of what happened on the Day of Atonement. Okay? Um, the next section that we have is called the Holiness Code. This all follows in sequence. It starts off, here's how you can be made holy by sacrifice. And here's about the priests who will do that, who, who are responsible for taking care of it. And those sacrifices need to be applied uh, in particular ways if you make yourself clean or if you make yourself unclean by doing certain things. All of that is part of how you get clean. Then, um, and the, the Day of Atonement being the ultimate act for cleaning all of the people of Israel once a year. Okay, this is, this is the sin cleaning, sort of spiritual spring cleaning of all of the people that the high priest would do. And then the holiness code is instruction on how you then should live in order to stay holy. In order to keep the holiness, the godness of God, if you will, to be more godly which literally means to be more like God, to be more holy. This is how you're supposed to live. Um, and it goes through, um, in this section of the, what's called the Holiness Code, it's called that because it is full of these references um, where it says, I am God, I am Yahweh, and I am holy, and therefore if you're my people, you should be holy. I am holy, and so you should be holy. I am holy, and I desire for you to be holy. It says that over and over and over again through this section, which is why it's called the Holiness Code. And in the process, it gives instructions for how it is we are supposed to live 
in order to be holy. Um, and here in, um, in the Holiness Code, we have the great commandment that Jesus quotes in the New Testament. When they ask him what the greatest commandment is, he said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. This is from the Holiness Code section of Leviticus. Shema Yisrael. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. This is from Leviticus. Jesus is quoting it when he says it in the New Testament. Um, the Holiness Code then gets into some very particular things about the, um, the calendar. It talks about the fact that the, each seventh year is supposed to be a year of sabbatical in which um, land, if a Jew has gotten bankrupt and had to sell himself into slavery, well, he gets freed at the seventh year. If they have <coughs> sold land, you weren't allowed to completely sell land that was given to you as part of the covenant. You know, this, is, this is looking forward to the time of the end of the promised land. If, you, if your tribe, if you were part of the tribe, let's say, of Issachar, and your tribe was given a certain section of land, and so this much of it was yours, you were not allowed to just sell that to anybody. If you did sell it to some of you couldn't sell it to anybody who wasn't Jewish, and if you sold it to a Jew, you were only selling it to them until the seventh year, which could be two years, three years, four years, five years from now, the seventh year, which was the, the year of the sabbatical year, or when all of it had to return to the original person that owned it. So when you sold a piece of property, you weren't really selling it, you were leasing it for whatever period of time was from now till the time it all had to be redeemed, it all had to be given back. Okay, now you could, there were allocations or allowances for you to be able to sell it to somebody who was part of your tribe. But there were strict limits, and the stuff had to go back. You know, people had to be freed if they'd sold themselves into slavery because they were bankrupt. The land had to go back to whoever owned it originally, because that was part of God's plan, is for those people to own it. All of that is built in here, and then you have every seventh sabbatical year, so every 49 years, you have the year of Jubilee, which is supposed to be a time when for two years, basically, the land was supposed to lie fallow, there was supposed to be you know, a great rest on the part of the people, and everything was supposed to go back to the way it was. The idea of these calendar cycles existing was in order to keep balance, to keep things from getting, you know, for instance, from, from one person owning half the promised land. Couldn't happen under these rules. Things, the balance was maintained. Um, even the poorest of people every seventh year would get back their land and get a chance to start all over again. It was a great balancing out of things so that everybody was protected. The rich could not take advantage of the poor, at least not for very long, until they had a chance to start again. Extraordinary idea. Yes, Ron? Mr. Slim would not like that. Mr. Slim. What's that? Mr. Slim. Oh, yeah, Carlos. <laughs> Carlos. A lot of people wouldn't like that. That's probably why we don't do anything like that today. So, John? Did, did the land go back um, every seven years? And every 50 years, uh, or was it? Um, I'm not real clear on that. Yeah, the, the, the sabbatical year, every seven year, I think there's supposed to be a, a, a sort of small rebalance and every every like slave jubilee. Like, like yeah, slavery. Like the, the, there could be a slave for long death. But every 50th year, I think everything, right. you know, what, and it may be, I'm not even sure about this, but it may be that, for instance, uh, the changes within a tribe, like I mentioned if I were part of the Issachar, then it might still, as long as the, the sabbatical year, it might just have to remain within Issachar, but eventually it had to go back to the individuals. You know, so, um, yeah, and I don't even know the particulars of that. And the strange thing is that we have some examples of the sabbatical year being practiced, small, not a lot, um, but we have no record of the year of Jubilee. You know, the 50th year, 49th year, basically, 7 times 7, 7 times 7. Um, they may have done it early on, but they didn't do it later. We don't have any record of that. Uh, and you imagine that'd be pretty hard, because rich people wanted to keep what they bought. Yes, Suzanne? So in the beginning, when the Israelites went into Canaan, were they each given land by tribe? Yes. And so that would then have been an inheritance down through? Absolutely. The promised land which God had promised to the people, once it had been conquered, 
which wasn't as simple as it should have been because they got halfway and then they just gave up. And um, then they had to start it all over again later. That's during the period of the judges, for instance. It wasn't until then later Saul and then mostly David stepped in and actually fulfilled the conquering of the land, which they were supposed to do. Um, and, and interestingly enough, God says why it is that he didn't just give it to them, why they had to fight for it, is he said that if, if everybody had been driven off, the wild animals and everything would have taken over, and that would have been a bigger problem than trying to fight battles to take it. Okay? Mm -hmm. So when the promised land was conquered, it was divided up section by section according to the various of the, the 12 tribes. Um, actually, the 11 tribes plus two, because Joseph got uh, a double portion. And the Levites were not given a portion of land. They were given cities and enough area to maintain some herds, but they didn't have uh, farmlands and stuff like that. So it was divided up according to the tribes of Israel, each of the 12 the descendants of the 12 sons of Jacob of Israel. And that was their property. And so that wasn't, in, excuse me, that wasn't until the time of David? No. It started during the time of the judges. When they came in, they started dividing it up, but they didn't fully conquer all of it until later on. Uh, David was the one who finally accomplished the conquering of all of the, of all of it. Actually, the, the original promise was from the Euphrates River to the Mediterranean, and from the far north down to the border of Egypt. The actual original promise was more than the Israelites have ever really controlled. Um, and it's because they gave up, they fell short. Um, not because God overpromised, but because they underachieved. Uh, you know, they chose not to follow up, even though God was saying, you know, if you'll be obedient to me and go and do this, that's why they wandered around for 40 years in the desert, for instance, is even though God had promised it, and they had people who were willing to say, Joshua and others, yes, we can do this, they were all scared. They said, there are giants on that land. They have fortified cities. We can't do that, you know. You know and so they wandered around until that whole generation of unfaith died before they could go in, okay? So, um, the importance of the book of Leviticus. I think there's several things that I would say about why it's important. Um, assuming I can find my notes and don't have to keep reading what's up there. Uh, I'm sorry, talk amongst yourselves. Here you go. Here are my notes. Okay. Uh, first, the Israelites were told in the book of Exodus, actually they were told as far back as Abram, that they were going to be God's chosen people. God, that's God's promise to Abraham when he was still Abram. If you will follow me, that's all you have to do, there were no other laws back then. Follow me, I will be your God, you'll be my guy, and I will do two things. I will give you a people, I will make you the father of a nation, and I will give you a promised land for them to live in. That promise had been made to Abram, and then in Exodus, these same people we're talking about now in Leviticus, had come to Mount Sinai, and God had told them that they were the people that he'd been talking about all this time. There's a sense in which while they were in Egypt, the Israelites had lost, had lost a sense of being God's, you know, the people of the promise. That they were promised through Abraham that they were going to be something great. It was Moses that reminded them of that. And then Moses brought them out of Egypt by the power of God, brought them to Mount Sinai, and at the foot of Mount Sinai, while they were there, God gave them the law, the Ten Commandments, and then the rest of the mitzvah, the rest of the commandments that went with it. And, and in doing that, sort of reestablished that you are my people, you are God's chosen people, but then the question remained, all right, you're God and we're us, how do we relate? You know, how is this relationship going to work? What are the terms of this relationship? The book of Leviticus tells the Israelites specifically how their relationship with God is supposed to work. What is God doing as his side of the relationship? He'd already proven that by redeeming them, by bringing them out of Egypt, by protecting them along the way in the desert, by giving them the law. But then what are the Jews supposed to do in order to fulfill their side of the agreement so that their relationship works? No relationship works unless each side understands what it is they're bringing to the relationship. And the book of Leviticus is the definition of what each side is supposed to bring to the relationship. God will forgive them of their sins and be present to them and allow them in his presence. And the Israelites will accept the process by which their sins are forgiven and then work to live a holy life afterwards. To be made holy and then to live in a way that will allow them to remain holy. 
And that's two. Specifically, it explained how the people were to become holy and then how they were to remain holy. The sacrifices would bring them into a state of holiness where they had received the holiness that was the nature and character of God and then how they should live in order to keep that. Didn't mean they wouldn't fall or stumble or make mistakes or sin, but there was processes by which that could be dealt with, either intentional sin or more often unintentional sin. You know, you uh, turned over a rock and ended up touching a dead animal that was underneath it, okay? There's a process by which that could be made okay. You know, first you wash, get rid of those germies. Well, they, that's not in there. I made that part out. <laughs> but then go through a process whereby you could be made clean <coughs> that night. Uh, then, third, the importance is that Leviticus tells the people of Israel how they are to become a nation rather than just a people. It literally is their constitution. Our constitution is what? It defines who we are as a people. We, uh, us. I'm talking to Americans now. I mean, you know, the Canadians have their own version. But the constitution defines who we are, and then it tells us what our laws are. That's what Exodus and Leviticus does. Actually, the, this section, we talk about Leviticus, the divisions between Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy are, um, are not necessary where they are. In other words, this was all written as one. It's, it's broken up like so much of the Old Testament was broken up because there's only so much you can put in one scroll. But in fact, from Exodus 19 to Numbers 10, including Leviticus in the middle, all really is the Holiness Code. In other words, it starts with the Ten Commandments in Exodus 19, and it goes through Numbers 10, with Leviticus in the middle. All of that really is the whole, the, you know, the instruction on how we are supposed to live in a relationship with God. But Leviticus is what we're talking about right now, and that's the more particular details. Do you understand what I mean when it says that Leviticus, actually Exodus and Leviticus, um, told the people how to become a nation and not just a people? Abraham was promised he would have a people. All that meant is that he would have descendants, people who would be biologically related. That's what a people means. But they had no structure in terms of a constitution. They had no structure in terms of what it meant for them to be a nation, how they were to govern themselves, <coughs> recognizing that the priests were both religious leaders as well as, from Moses on, as being the predominantly the uh, political leaders, and from these priests, it goes on to the period of the judges, and the judges were political and religious leaders. And from there, we go on to the kings. And the kings were both, now they had priests and they had prophets, but they were also, King David was responsible to be the one who was in charge of, you know, the, the sort of uh, priest of all priests kind of thing. He was, he was the one who brought the Ark of the Covenant in. He's the one that danced before the Lord. He's the one that, that sort of led the religious direction of the people, even though there were, there were priests and there were prophets. He had responsibility for that, in addition to being political. And so, the idea is that this, from Exodus 19, all of Leviticus through Numbers 10, or to the start of Numbers 10, we have what made them more than just a biological people, it made them into a nation, a religious and political form, because it was their constitution. Does that make sense? Mary? Because they weren't organized as a, a people uh, under in, when they were in Egypt. As that, a nation. They weren't organized as, as a, a nation. nation. Is that how they were so easily enslaved by the Egyptians when there were so many more? Or maybe, I don't know, no more, but there were so many Hebrews, but they yeah. couldn't pull? Well, perhaps. Um, we don't really know. I mean, we go from the end of Genesis when... Joseph's death, when the Israelites were still had in, held in very high regard, because you know Joseph had brought them there, and he was second only to Pharaoh in all of the land of Egypt. And we skip forward 400 years when we get to the start of Exodus, and all we know is there arose a Pharaoh who did not know Joseph, and he had enslaved the Israelites. We don't really know what the process was. Um, it's very possible that it was affected by the fact that they did not have a sense of national unity. There was no sense of them being a nation. They were a they were a tribe. You know, what's the difference in a tribe and a nation? You know, when I say people, you might think tribe, meaning we're all, we're all related somehow, but there's no organized structure here. There's no set of laws. There's no constitution. We don't have any written documents at that point that told us, remember, the first written documents 
Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Who wrote them, we believe? Moses. And anybody who doesn't think it was Moses think they got written a lot later. And so at the time of the Egyptian uh, slavery, they had no documents. They had no written uh, anything. All they had was a promise that they said to their ancestor Abraham. And that was easy to forget when you're having to work 18 hours a day making bricks without straw. And so it was Moses. That was why Moses was a prophet, the greatest of the prophets, why Moses was the lawgiver. He was the one through whom God turned them into more than just a tribe or people, turned them into a nation. They became the nation of Israel and not just the people of Israel. Okay? And you can, you can see um, Abraham was the father of them as a people. Moses brought the law, the constitution, and made them into a nation. David comes along as a king and makes them into a great nation. That's why those three are the most important figures in the Old Testament. Abraham, Moses, and David. You know, the father, the lawgiver, and the king. All right? Now... And finally, and this is in part, I think, that's important for us. I, my goal today was for you to have a sense that this, that reading Leviticus isn't completely foreign, that you can connect to it in some way to understand why this is part of God's Word, that it's not just, ooh, you know, let's rip out the kidneys and the covering of the liver and set it on fire. I mean, it's not, it's more than that. There's, it's what's behind that. And the fact that if we just think about parallels between the way we in the 21st century live and the, what we're hearing there in terms of, of things like purity and of you know offering and of all kinds of things that it's really not quite as different as we think when we first read it but particularly we need to recognize this is part of God's Word first this is part of God's Word to us and we can't just sort of you know you're reading through the Bible and you get to the end of Exodus and goes okay I'm gonna skip over to numbers no it's there for a reason it's valuable to us and particularly and I'm quoting here from your Old Testament text Leviticus still speaks to us about reverence in worship, purity in lifestyle, and our need for forgiveness. All of those principles are still true. And that's what Leviticus is about. And the principles behind Leviticus, even though we don't still do the ritual part of it, the principles are all still there. They're all valid. And we need to understand the principles, even if we don't understand the ripping out the liver kind of stuff. And finally... The major themes, I'll finish with this, the major themes in Leviticus, first is obviously the law. The law is what made them a nation. The law is what makes any nation a nation. It was God's instruction to them is, this is how you need to live in order to be my people. This is, this is when you were sworn, you know, if, if you weren't a naturalized citizen in whatever country you're now a citizen of, you swore that you would, one, understand, and two, you would be obedient to the laws of the land. That's part of being sworn in as a person. You know, well, that's what this was. If you are going to be my people, if you're going to be part of my nation, my chosen people of Israel, here are the laws you need to obey. Secondly, it had to do with sacrifice. And as I say, um, I think it's accurate to say that worship, all worship of all people ever, no matter what the religious belief, has always had some aspect of sacrifice. Our worship as Christians is based upon the sacrifice that Jesus made for us on our behalf. So we have sacrifice as part of our beliefs. In addition to that, to take seriously the Christian faith, we are told, Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. And some of those commandments mean giving up things. It means making sacrifices. Uh, we are called upon, you know, it's not a law, but we are called upon if we are living a righteous life to, to give of uh, the blessings God has given us back to the things of God. There are sacrifices involved even today, even though the predominant sacrifice of our faith is the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. The third major theme is offering. As they say, people ridicule the idea that God wants us to bring him offerings. You know, he's supposed to be God. What does he need with this stuff? It's not what he needs. It's what we need. We need to be willing to show our love, to show our devotion. No different to God than to anyone else that we love and want to show devotion to. Both for our sake, because we find it satisfying and fulfilling, and also because they are deserving of it. You know, I buy gifts for Carolyn. She doesn't need anything. I don't need anything. We buy each other gifts as a sign of affection, of devotion, of love. How is that any different than what we should be doing with God? 
Fourth, the idea of atonement, that our sins can be taken away. And atonement, I, I think a pretty good perspective of that, somebody said the definition of atonement is exactly what it says, at one moment. We are separated from God by our sin, and there's a process by which we can be brought back into union with God by having our sins taken away. That's what atonement means, at one moment. It also talks about forgiveness. Here's how you get forgiven. There's a process by which you can be forgiven initially, and we have the sacrifice of Jesus Christ to do that, but then we also, by prayer and by repentance, can be forgiven of our sins today as we continue to sin throughout our lives. Well, that idea of being forgiven initially and then a process by which you can be forgiven as you go along is introduced in Leviticus. That's where it starts. The idea of holiness. Holiness being the very character and nature of God that He imbues on people. To become more holy means to become more godly, more like God, to take on more of the nature of what makes God, God. And so by doing so, becoming more holy, we are drawn closer to Him. We are allowed more access. We are allowed to get closer to Him as we become more like Him. The idea of purity and impurity, clean and unclean that there are some things that simply are impure, that are unclean, that are not good for us and are not honoring to God, so we should stay away from those. There are other ways in which we can act that will make us more clean, more pure, more godly. And we need to understand that how we act makes a difference. That's part of it. What we do makes a difference. Partly because it's, you know, what we do is a product of our will. What we do on the outside is a product of what we have on the inside. And it affects that. Cleanliness really is next to godliness in a very, very real way. And finally, the idea of priesthood, that there are those that God has anointed to leadership, and they have responsibility for leading the people of God. And that it's a very serious thing. Again, as I said when, in the New Testament, when it says you shouldn't be too quick to want to teach because those who teach are going to be held to a higher standard. God anoints and ordains people, and not just formally. I mean, it doesn't just mean those of us who have been formally ordained in the ministry. God, I believe, as we are followers of Jesus Christ, He anoints and ordains people of various kinds of ministry. That's why the Holy Spirit gives different kinds of gifts. Every Christian, every follower of Jesus Christ, we are told, is given one or more divinely initiated gifts by the Holy Spirit. We are all, in some way, miracle workers. Even if the miracle we work by the power of God, even if our, our little part of the priesthood Maybe the gifts of service, that we take out the trash and wash the dishes and clean up after Second Sunday. Whatever it is that God has anointed us to by the Holy Spirit, that is our little piece of the priesthood now. And as Protestants, we believe in, you know, when we talk about all believers having responsibility uh, to, to use their gifts, one of the basic tenets of the Reformation and one of the basic principles of Reformed theology, which is what Presbyterian theology is, Reformed theology, one of the, of the four basic prim premises is the priesthood of all believers. We are all part of the priesthood by using the gifts we've been given. And so when we read about this extraordinary seven-day ordination of Aaron and his sons, we need to realize that as we accept Jesus Christ, we too have been ordained in some way. Because being a believer in Jesus makes you part of the priesthood. May not take you seven days to get there, but you know. Okay, questions about any of that? Comments? I hope that Leviticus makes a little more sense to you now because it is the most neglected and most misunderstood book in the Bible. The one people have the most trouble with thinking it's just weirdness. As you learn, as you figure out what it's about, where it's going, and what the premises behind it are, I think it makes a whole lot of sense. And I think it's really valuable because it teaches us. We may not understand the particular ritual applications, but the principles behind all those ritual applications are things that we really need to be aware of and concerned about. Okay? Questions, comments? Well done. Really. Appreciate it. Ron? I was almost offended by it, but now I sure feel a lot better. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Well, you know, again, I understand that. When you read Leviticus, a lot of it offends our Western sensibilities. And I think it helps us then, because we feel offended by part of it, to realize that in many ways, it was the institution of a very civilized way of being. We think, this is barbaric. 
Okay, sacrifice and animals. But then you realize the purity codes and the clean and unclean things, it actually does far more to institute a civilized understanding of how we're supposed to live than it does a barbaric way. It is a very civilized code. And granted, it was written on 3,000 years ago, and 3,000 years ago they had a very different standard about what was acceptable. I don't know about you, I have never actually, you know, bled a bull and then skinned it and then cut it up in pieces. I've never done that. You know, my meat comes wrapped in plastic. <laughs> and yet, that was the world they lived in. And so what seems to us as barbaric was, was part of their world. And so they would not have had that reaction to those things. We have to appreciate that. That's why I say we always need to think of, we, while we can appreciate in hindsight that the, all aspects of the Old Testament find their fulfillment in the New Testament, we also have to understand the context and the meaning that it had for the people right then. Um, there's always a danger, especially when we, when we take 21st century sensibilities and we try to apply them to 15th century BC and say, well, how did they do that? Very different world, and we need to appreciate that. Thank you all.